Well, again, welcome everyone to our subcommittee today. I'm Ian Thomas Safoya for the people who are tuning in, subcommittee chair and co-chair of the Environmental Justice Action Task Force. Uh, I think we'll start, well, we'll start with, a, I think, a land acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge that we're in the headwater state with more than 48 tribes called Colorado home because of the water. Um, the Comanche, the Shoshone, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Ute, the Pueblo, um, and many others. Um, including my ancestors. And so we just recognize that it goes beyond talking about the words, it goes to taking action. And we're excited that the Environmental Justice Task Force has also created a subcommittee for that. With that being said, Joel, do we need to take a role for this committee as well? And I think since we just have five members, now that um, Megan has rolled off the task force, we, we don't need to. So um, it's like we have four of our five members here. Um, Michael, Robin, you, um, and Tyson, and, and we're just missing Renee. So if we don't get Renee soon, we'll, know, we'll follow up with her. And I, I think we're good to start, so. Okay, and then if other people are interested in learning more about the people who are on the task force, please go to our website, Colorado, what is it, cdphe.gov forward slash environmental justice, and you can read more. We also have in-depth bios and uh, the first meeting we went in-depth talking about ourselves. So today on the agenda, we have a presentation about his history of environmental racism, another presentation about census data reliability, and then a discussion about outstanding questions. I think after uh, Saturday, we got to see a lot of what got pulled together, and then we'll have public comment. Does anybody have anything else that they'd like to add to the committee agenda before we get started? Okay, then um, I think we'll start with the presentation from Tova Salzinger. She's an EJ unit intern, and she has been working on the research on the history of Colorado environmental racism. So feel free to unmute yourself, and I think they're going to pull up the uh, presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Tova. I'm a senior at Colorado College. And I have been interning with the Environmental Justice Unit at CEPHE um, for this year. And I've specifically been looking into the his researching the history of environmental racism as defined in the Environmental Justice Act, um, specifically looking at urban communities. So looking at specific neighborhoods in Denver, Colorado Springs, Boulder, Pueblo and Grand Junction that could be identified as being historically disproportionately impacted. Um, so before I get into the specific cities, I just wanna go across like a few key dates and time periods that are important kind of across the board. So one thing that's really important to acknowledge is the first um, exclusionary policies and the first disproportionately impacted communities were those policies that removed um, indigenous residents from the land. And obviously this differs based on which um, city you're looking at, which indigenous groups were impacted, but those are just like some of the first exclusionary policies that were implemented across Colorado. And then in the 1920s, the KKK became much more prevalent than it had ever been in Colorado. Um, and definitely targeted many of residents of these disproportionately impacted communities in all of these cities. So that's just something that's important to keep in mind. But it was in the 1930s when specific um, exclusionary zoning laws began to be implemented and red line maps began to appear. So red line maps were created by the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which was a government funded program that was created by the New Deal. Um, and these maps basically outlined different cities across the country and gave different neighborhoods grades based on their racial composition, which then impacted residents of different neighborhoods ability to apply for loans and accumulate wealth. Um, and this basically impacted across the entire United States, like residents of color versus white residents ability to acquire wealth at the same rate. Um, and something else that began around the 1930s and continues is de facto segregation. So this is segregation that is done by practice rather than law and is kind of segregation that's furthered through social custom rather than ever being codified into law. Um, and then one last key date is 
after World War II in the 1940s and 1950s, there was a population increase um, kind of across all of these cities and an increase in diversity. And this led to many wealthy white residents kind of moving out of urban communities and then this leading to um, a lack of investment in many urban communities and change in neighborhood demographics. But just moving to our first city, so looking specifically at Denver, um, since the mid 1800s, white and wealthy residents have mostly lived in Southern Denver and lower income and residents of color have more often lived in Northern Denver. And this is a direct result, result of redlining and racial covenants and zoning. So if you look on the right side of the screen, this is a redlined map that was published in the 1930s of Denver. Um, and many of these neighborhoods that were redlined, like I mentioned before, were given and being redlined on this map means they're shaded in either red or yellow, um, means that these neighborhoods were given this grade because of their racial or ethnic composition. Um, and so just going into some of these disproportionately and historically disproportionately impacted communities, um, the first one that I wanted to point to was Five Points, which was a red neighborhood that was historically black in Denver. Um, and Auraria and Highlands were historically Latinx neighborhoods in Denver. And these were all um, neighborhoods that were redlined on this map. And these neighborhoods are kind of tricky when you think about um, them being historically disproportionately impacted communities and then having been impacted by um, gentrification, largely specifically when you're looking at the Auraria neighborhood because of the urban, the Denver Urban Restoration Association's um, messaging around urban blight and their attempt to kind of make beautify the city and this um, they ran like a campaign that displaced residents and kind of raised a lot of homes and led to the creation of space for a university but then displaced this community and led to gentrification of many of these neighborhoods um, and so that means that many of these neighborhoods that were redlined or went through a process of urban renewal have since undergone a process of gentrification so many of Denver's historically low income and residents of color or neighborhoods of color are inaccessible to those residents who historically lived there. And then thinking about the Globeville, Elyria and Swansea neighborhoods, these are areas that generally housed industry in the 1800s. Um, they had a lot of smelters in, this neighbor, in these neighborhoods and today they're still facing a combination of exposure to many different pollutants, which come from I-70 and I-25. And these neighborhoods also have two Superfund sites and six brownfield sites, which means that they have some of the highest scores in Colorado and BioScreen. So definitely dealing with a lot of environmental justice issues, um, both historically and today in these neighborhoods. And then today, when you look at where a majority of Denver's Latinx population is living, many of these residents are living in Southwest Denver today. Um, so this is in neighborhoods like Barnum, Westwood, Via Park, Offmar Park, and Ruby Hill. And Montbello and Green Valley Ranch are where a majority of Black, Den Black residents are living in Denver. Um, so many environmental justice issues, contemporary environmental justice issues are concentrated in these neighborhoods today, as opposed to these historically disproportionately impacted communities. Um, and moving on to Colorado Springs, um, on the right side of the screen, once again, this is a redlined map, but this is actually a draft of a redlined map. So there was never a redlined map fully published and implemented in Colorado Springs, but that doesn't mean that these patterns don't exist today. So if you compare, for example, this map with patterns of zoning that we see today, you can see that neighborhoods that were redlined um, have higher rates of zoning for industry and also for multifamily residences. Whereas if you look at neighborhoods that were not redlined, um, these areas have higher rates of zoning for like single family um, housing. So this has potential negative public health outcomes. Um, but in Colorado Springs, 
higher income white residents were mostly able to live in Northern Colorado Springs, whereas lower income and residents of color mostly um, could only live in red line neighborhoods that were mostly located in Southern Colorado Springs. So some of these neighborhoods in Northern Colorado Springs are at the Old North End and the Broadmoor. Um, and similarly to Denver, they, these neighborhoods had racial covenants um, in many of the deeds of the homes, which meant that residents of color were not allowed to rent or buy many of these homes. And this impacts the demographics of these neighborhoods today. Um, and in the 1950s, there was a study done about um, black home buyers and just talking about some social customs that although there were no like actual laws in Colorado Springs that prevented residents of color from buying or renting homes in specific neighborhoods, the study outlined how there was a lack of realtors who would sell to black residences, excuses as to why property suddenly became unavailable once um, realtors discovered that their clients were black and just like general restrictions as to where someone could buy within the city, even though these restrictions weren't codified into law. So then just talking specifically about some of these historically disproportionately impacted communities in Colorado Springs, the Conejos neighborhood was historically a Latinx working class neighborhood um, that just had kind of a lack of public investment for many years. Through the 1970s, there weren't sewers, lights, or paved roads in the area. And this is also where the Martin Drake coal power plant was located. Um, and residents kept com complaining over the years to the city about health issues that they were having as a result of living near the coal power plant. Um, but the city said that it wasn't possible to determine the cause and effect relationship between air pollution and health impacts and kind of didn't really move to make any significant changes in the neighborhood until they bought out residents' homes um, in the late 1980s, 1990s, um, and bulldozed the entire neighborhood for the America the Beautiful Park. Um, and residents were relocated mostly to southern, southeastern Colorado Springs, which is where um, historically populations of color were confined in Colorado Springs. And similarly to Denver, there were also um, processes of urban renewal throughout the 1960s and to, until the 1980s. And this mostly took place downtown in Shooks Run, old Colorado City and on the west side. Um, and once again, the, the process of urban renewal mostly served to break up communities rather than provide helpful investments and like listen to what the residents wanted. And in Pueblo, um, this is the last city where in Colorado where there is an actual red line map and this map was actually published. Um, one thing that was really important to the development of Pueblo were smelters, which, lit, which operated in Pueblo from the late 1800s until 1921 and were mostly located in neighborhoods that would become redlined in the 1930s, similarly with Colorado Fuel and Iron, which was a steel mill. And one thing that's really important to note about these smelters is they processed a lot of different metals, but one thing that they did process was lead, and this has led to some pretty significant environmental justice issues today. Um, so these factories were really important for the development of Pueblo and people could get free passage from anywhere in the world if you said that you were coming to work at one of these um, factories, which meant that there was a pretty significant population of Southern European immigrant workers, particularly. Um, and the neighborhoods that had higher concentrations of immigrants, blue collar workers and residents of color were located much closer to low-lying floodplains, which is an environmental hazard. And these were also many of the neighborhoods that housed industry and were later redlined. Um, and this proved pretty catastrophic in the 1921 Pueblo flood because um, those neighborhoods that were located close to the floodplain suffered a much higher rate of casualties, which means that lower income immigrant and residents of color were much more significantly impacted by the flood. Just looking at some of these redline areas 
there is a lasting history with negative health impacts because of smelters in the area and lead levels in the soil being elevated. This is something that CDPHE is still working on cleaning up. Um, specifically, the Ehlers, Bessemer, and Grove neighborhoods, which were all previously redlined, um, these areas were designated a Superfund site in 2014 uh, as a result of the Colorado Smelting Company being located there and there being high le um, elevated lead levels in the soil in these areas. And then Salt Creek, Ehler Heights, Bessemer, Dog Patch, and Avondale are all neighborhoods that were historically redlined and are dealing with different environmental justice issues today because they have multiple large sources of pollution in these neighborhoods. In Boulder, um, there are, there's only one or two historically disproportionately impacted communities that I was able to identify. Um, so I'd also go, get into that pretty briefly. So the Goss Grove or the Little Rectangle on the west side are historically where residents of color were restricted to. And similarly to, to Pueblo, these neighborhoods proximity had pretty significant proximity to the Boulder Creek, which meant that they were also located in a floodplain and were more susceptible to flooding. And until the 1980s um, in the Goss Grove neighborhood, residents complained about poor quality housing and a lack of investment, which meant that there was kind of no street drainage or trash collecting services and there were unpaved streets until the 1980s, which is pretty significant. But in the entire city of Boulder, after World War II, there was this population boom and new corporate and government employers were brought to the city or moved to the city in the 1950s until the 1970s. And this led to kind of an increase in population growth and so Boulder implemented a lot of different um, forms of exclusionary zoning, which served to make Boulder pretty inaccessible to low-income residents today. So the first thing that was implemented was the Blue Line, which restricted water development above 5,700 feet of elevation. Next, the Green Belt was a tax referendum, which allowed the city to buy and maintain open space around the city so the city couldn't grow outwards and it limited urban growth. Then there was a height, a limit on building height that was implemented in 1971, which meant that the city couldn't grow upwards. And then the Danish plan limited population growth in 1976. Um, so all of these different policies limited, uh, altogether limited population growth outwards, upwards, and in terms of numbers. And essentially these policies are a form of exclusionary zoning. So land use policies, they're basically land use policies that either intentionally or unintentionally are excluding low income or people of color. And because they're working to increase housing prices, which is acting as a form of housing dis discrimination, making Boulder today um, a pretty inaccessible place to live. And then lastly, moving on to Grand Junction. Um, this is pretty apparent or this is significant in across all of these cities, like I mentioned at the beginning, but it's most apparent in Grand Junction um, that the first disproportionately impacted community were the indigenous groups there because of the Teller Institute. So the Teller Institute was a boarding school for indigenous children whose stated goal was to materially aid in the civilization of the youths um, and essentially Indigenous children were taken away from their families and taught English, not allowed to speak their native language or practice um, culturally appropriate things. And so this is just a pretty clear example of Indigenous communities being disproportionately impacted by these policies. Then when you look at neighborhoods in Grand Junction that um, historically and today have been disproportionately impacted. They are pretty dependent on, their growth has been pretty dependent on the sugar beet industry as well as the Climax uranium mill. So just starting off with Las Colonias, um, the sugar beet industry in Grand Junction began in the late 1800s and in 1916, Holly Sugar Company 
began to build longhouses in the neighborhood that today is Las Colonias. And these were essentially homes where workers for the sugar beet industry could live with their families during and after the sugar beet season um, free of charge. And as a majority of these workers were Latinx, this kind of started this predominantly Latinx community in this neighborhood. And although the sugar beet industry left the area in the 1940s, in the 1950s, the uranium mill, Climax uranium mill moved into many of their abandoned buildings. Um, and this led to some pretty negative health impacts for residents. But after the sugar beet industry left Grand Junction, many of Las Colonias residents moved to La Gara and then to Riverside and finally to El Poso. So these are kind of the primary disproportionately impacted communities all located in Southern Grand Junction. And I was able to speak with a community activist from Grand Junction who spoke to me about discrimination and like a lack of investment in these neighborhoods. And today the La Gara neighborhood is mostly full of industry and Las Colonias, Riverside and El Poso neighborhoods are all situated pretty close to highways and large roads, which means that air pollution is increased and this has a potential to increase respiratory illnesses and heart disease. And many of these neighborhoods also have a lack of green space or well-maintained green space. So it's kind of this continuation of a lack of investment in these areas. Thank you. And does anyone have any questions? I have a question um, about Grand Junction. And when I organize out there, <clears throat> I often go to the community of Clifton. Was mm -hmm. Clifton also in one of these areas or are those neighborhoods like a part of Clifton? Um, Clifton is like in Mesa County, but not in Grand Junction. But I was able to speak with um, Jose Chavez, who you may have worked with if you've um, organized in Grand Junction, and he was talking to me a little bit about how Clifton is facing a lot of issues in terms of the fact that it's an unincorporated town and not being able to receive a significant amount of funding from the county. And there's kind of a lack of green space in some of these neighborhoods in Grand Junction that I was mentioning, like Las Colonias and La Gara have gentrified somewhat and so many residents that used to live there have moved to Clifton um, and he was talking about some of these just like continuing environmental justice issues in Clifton and that's definitely something that I talk about a little bit more in the written version of the report that I'm still working on. Go ahead and jump in Tyson. First of all thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> this is a uh, this is exactly the type of research and data that helps us uh, as a task force really, really put our minds to things. On in regard to the historic data, how do you see our ability to look at that historic data versus the new data on things such as gentrification um, and and, and you know, being able to decipher which one, because there are, there are neighborhoods that had, had terrible impacts in the 60s that are now, uh, you know, all multi-million dollar homes um, and, and people that, that, from my standpoint anyways, when I think of what our job here is and the recommendations we're going to make are going to lead to things like investment and appropriations of funds and uh, cleanup opportunities and rehabilitation opportunities. How do we prevent that from going to these places where just the money of, of the residents have, have already begun or started or, or, or have the ability to do that when we could be putting that money towards communities that don't have those opportunities? I think it's important to like recognize that certain neighborhoods are were historically disproportionately impacted communities, but if today like those neighborhood demographics have changed, then I see what you're saying. And I don't really think that it would make sense for the funds to go there. So I think it's important to look at those communities and look at a history 
of like exclusionary zoning policies in certain areas and then if you can see that those policies are still impacting populations that live in those areas like some of the neighborhoods in Grand Junction um, and in Pueblo for example um, then that's really important but like looking at some of the neighborhoods in Denver that have just gentrified and then like I think it's important to recognize the history but then looking at the present is also key so like if there's a disconnect between those groups then probably that's not where the funding should be going and it should be going more to those communities that are struggling with environmental justice issues today Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for putting this presentation together. Um, really great historical overview. Um, you gave a statewide perspective. Um, I think this is one of the reasons uh, why I'm excited to have the honor to serve on, on this task force because we get a chance to uh, see some of the sense uh, that have occurred in the 20th century and how people of color were, were marginalized and put uh, near facilities, highways, um, uh, lack of banking opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. And we get a chance to try to recorrect those sins or recorrect those wrongs uh, in a way that kind of addresses what Tyson brings up that, you know, a lot of these communities, because of gentrification, they're no longer they're no longer, the, the population is no longer there, but uh, how do we recognize that while also still recognizing? Because one of the, the saddest parts, I mean, my family's from Denver, grew up on the east side. I still live on the east side, but my family migrated to Montbello in the 60s and 70s and now live in Green Valley Ranch near the airport. It's sad when they come down to the east side now because the neighborhood doesn't look like it did when they grew up and a lot of the cultural institutions are no longer present and so um i think it's just good to have this space where we can can talk about it and, and kind of get to root causes of how we can turn those challenges and opportunities so i just want to say thank you um mr chair i didn't know that well i think that's an interesting conversation that you all are talking about because just because gentrification happens to a community doesn't necessarily mean every single person is removed from that community or their descendants, right? Like there are people we know who are holding it on. They're trying their best as property taxes are increasing. And so would we, would we inadvertently be removing um, those people who are the, perhaps the hardest to reach, right? Because they're also facing the housing pressures. I agree with you completely. And yeah, um, I think I think it's a good. Go ahead, Michael. No, I, and I think you're spot on. And I think that uh, we can't leave people behind. I mean, I, there are a lot of people. I stay on Marion Street, and there are about three neighbors who uh, they're they're generational. Their families bought homes here decades ago. And they're holding on. I mean, these homes are their grandparents' homes, and they didn't sell their home. And so they're dealing with property taxes increases. They're dealing with uh, inflation and everything that a lot of us or everyone else is dealing with. And so uh, how do we make sure that uh, we're addressing their needs because they've lived it and they, and they still have a desire to stay here. So um, I, I, I think you're spot on, and I think we need to make sure that we're not leaving people behind. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think there's just a, it brings you to the, to the point of how do you, how do you create that inclusion, right? I mean, um, I, in my opinion, those folks who are holding on in those neighborhoods because they, you know, were fortunate enough to be able to pay off their house at one point and they, you know, and they're, they're able to, to stay in those neighborhoods, they, they're going to go to these community meetings and, um, you know, how do you, how do you make sure that they remain to, uh, to have a voice? You know, how do you, how do you create, do you, do we need to create liaisons for people in, in historic 
areas that have been disproportionately impacted that are changing? Uh, do we need to, you know, I mean, I think some of this has to go with the other communities of, or the other community uh, engagement uh, subcommittees and, and how we deal with that piece. But as you go to appropriations of funds, as you go to appropriations of opportunities, you know, you almost have to provide those opportunities on a community basis and also an individual basis. Um, and, you know, as things progress, we're going to need to get into those discussions on how do you, how do you not leave out, um, everyone? I mean, obviously there's, there's never hardly a solution that, that takes into account everyone, but, but how do you create the best solution that captures the most of those impacted folks that may have been there for three or four generations and struggled with family health issues because of where they worked or where they lived or where they drink their water. Um, it's, it's an important piece to think about. Go ahead, Joel. Thank you, Ian. And Tyson, I agree. And I, I think what I'm hearing emerge in the, the conversation that you, Michael and, and Ian are having is the idea that if you know this subcommittee is is focused on the definition of disproportionately impacted community, um, communities that have a history of environmental racism, the the areas that Tova has been researching are are part of that definition. So if you decide that the definition should continue to include those communities as, as part of the definition, I think what I'm, I'm hearing is um, that there may need to be different applications essentially that when we think about things like grant funding there should be different considerations for areas that maybe only meet the definition under the historical prong because they've gentrified and, and that no longer really represents the population who lives there or, or environmental impacts on the ground um, similarly that if there are communities that are sort of in the, the both category they um, historically were um, an area that had exclusionary laws and policies like redlining apply there and continue to be places where um, a large proportion of people of color live um, or, or low income populations live, there may need to be special attention in the policies of thinking about how to avoid um, contributing to gentrification or focusing on, on policies that um, can empower a community against gentrification. So thinking about our, our Brownfields program and, and the Hazardous Materials and Waste Management Division that does um, you know, redevelopment work essentially of, of previously contaminated areas. I think there are, there are tools and techniques and processes in that redevelopment process to sort of um, ensure that the benefits go to the folks who are currently living there, right? And, and so I, I think I'm hearing that you all wanna kind of think about really the, the impact of the policies that would be implemented differently depending on, on which policy it is, if it's something like grant funding versus um, you know what happens with an air permit there in the present day or, or what uh, some of our other environmental programs do differently depending on the sort of status of the gentrification. So I'm just kind of prodding you all to think about that because later on in this meeting, we'll, we'll be talking about brainstorming recommendations and just want to kind of synthesize what I think I'm hearing to kind of um, maybe bleed over into that conversation when we get there. Well, I think about the, let's say Globe Bill or maybe even there in Grand Junction, right? Whether or not the house costs a million dollars or it costs $500,000, those people are still being exposed to an excessive amount of pollution. And when there is something that's relevant to them to reduce that pollution load in their community, we want to be ensured that they're being informed, right? I I agree, and I you actually stole something that I was thinking, uh, and um, in that as folks move into these communities, they may not be aware of the contaminations of or the air quality things that we're we're very mindful of and their health matters too. And so um, I, I think we'll just need to have a parallel conversation with the community engagement subcommittee uh, that can go into these communities that get, that get identified um, and alert folks. And I mean, as we get, as we get moving, right? Like this is, you know, this short midterm, long-term, 
to alert folks and then let folks know potential grant opportunities. But um, I, that, that's a great point. I mean, I, I see people moving into the cold neighborhood all the time um, in Denver and um, beautiful homes, but you know, they're, they're being exposed to interstate I-70 um, and the construction project there. So point taken, and I think it's something uh, worth uh, talking about moving forward. Well, well especially, I, oh, go ahead. Go on, Tyson. Well, and, I, and I'm just thinking of, of application and, and how 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 we make you know create create a a definition that can be utilized by multiple agencies. Understanding that there's going to be different purpose for those agencies, and I think uh, we just may need to separate things in, in, into boxes such as notification um you know appropriations uh you know things of that nature to say hey we think you all should use this definition here and when utilizing it for a for a notification purpose use it on a broader fashion when utilizing it for appropriations ensure that you're up to date with current um demographics in, in uh, you know, to how to drill down. I mean, it, granted, that leaves some of the other state agencies uh, realm to, to make rules that surround that, but I think in anything we come up with is going to leave that open to their interpretation. So the more we can add to that to give them color on how this would be applied, I think is, is important. It has me thinking, you know, especially Michael, you working with um, the North Denver Cornerstone Collaborative all those years, right, where we saw the massive investment and in increased density into these communities. And where does the conversation about the Department of Local Affairs as they advise around zoning and it relates to added density and dangerous conditions and where does disclosure to property buyers and renters happen and, you know, I think the close disclosure for public health is incredibly important, but it also devalues their property. Um, and I think that's, I don't know what the right answer is there. Personally, my right answer is the health of people, but I could see people um, questioning what that means because it's, is that a new form of redlining because you're marking this historic toxic conditions or is it just a holdover? Uh, and again, what is the, what is the, it's not just the current demographic, but what is the current, what is the current state status of, of that particular environmental impact? Um, you know, each, each environmental impact is much different uh, across the state and, and how, how it's, you know, it's being remediated. Is it at a, is it at a level that's, that's not as, impactful as it used to be, but it's still improving. Uh, understanding that current data is, 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 I think, just as important. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I think it, it, it goes back down to application and scalability. I mean, and to your point, I mean, what the metro area saw in the last decade was unprecedented growth, where you saw you know, 100 plus thousand people move into the city with these huge macro projects. Um, um, and then you saw this supply demand issue that occurred in the house market uh, where it is today. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, you know, I think that, I think how I'm, how I'm visiting this group is that, um, and this is where I need some, some, some guidance from Joel and Lovna is we're, we're, we're setting the, the definition recommendations, and then we'll work with the other subcommittees on the application of these definitions for DICs. Is that, is that, is that accurate? Is that how I'm, is that, am I interpreting that correctly? Yeah, that, that's right. So this subcommittee, you're, you're focusing on what the definition is and, or, or should be, I guess, more accurately. And that's a critical part of the broader conversation that you all have with the rest of the task force about all the ways that that definition is, is implemented. 
Okay, that sounds good. I just, you know, haven't done years of, you know, community engagement and understanding community-based uh, planning and knowing assets and this community folks. Like, I, I, I just want to make sure that we're having a parallel conversation with the community engagement folks because I don't have context in Pueblo. I don't, I don't have knowledge in Colorado Springs, and so I just want to make sure that. Um, we're talking to folks on the ground, um, folks who have lived experience um, and getting their understanding. But I think that we can kind of set, and I, and I think the, the expertise on this subcommittee can, can really get us in a really good, can really set a, a solid foundation that um, I think when we start doing the, the broader engagement across the state this summer, I think that I, I'll feel really good going to those communities and kind of breaking down, is this definition, does this meet what you're going through in your community? So, Joe, thanks for, for giving me that background. I think that that gives me, that's, that gives me good juice to kind of work with uh, as we break this, as we begin to uh, define these, uh, these definitions for DIC. You're welcome, Michael. And I know we need to move on. So maybe as a, a closing thought there, you know, Tova's doing excellent research and we really appreciate her coming to present it today. As she mentioned, she's finishing her, her written summary of Grand Junction very soon. We're, we're really close to that. And then it's going to move on to the rural areas of the state. Um, obviously today we were just talking about urban areas. Um, and once that's wrapped up, Tova has graciously agreed to extend her time with us over the summer. Um, and over the course of the summer, we will work on convening some sort of forum when we, we have Tova's research completed, um, where we can kind of solicit input from community members and ensure we're reaching community members across the state to make sure that their lived experience is incorporated in the research. So there, there's a lot more to come, but it was really great to be able to give this, this update now on where we're at. So. I Unless think, it's further, oh, go ahead, Ian. Well, I think just to wrap up this conversation, I'm in the sense that we probably want to keep these people in because even in the gentrification and the increased density, these people deserve to be informed. Now, I would agree we should ask about resources and those other kinds of things, and that's a good question to flag to, to maybe elevate to the larger task force to have that conversation. And then I think just in conclusion, I'm in favor of uh, requesting our... Um, our staff and the communication staff, this, this, this information is a, is a new story. And I think we should be talking to History Colorado and the local uh, historical societies to spread this information for us to make them aware of it. And I think there's an incredible opportunity now um, to put our new found resources in the EJ task force to work um, spreading this message so that we know more individuals are aware of this historical context that has been developed. Um, okay, so our next presentation is from Brian Schultz, I apologize, and Rachel uh, Pierstorf. I, I'm so glad I'm not a legislator. I see them make these mistakes all the time of Dr. Cog about census data reliability in our communities. Great. Uh, thank you. And, and thank you all. This is Byron. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, well, I'll share my screen and... Um, let me know if you can see a presentation here. We're good. Great. Well, with that, um, I guess I'll let yeah Rachel um, start us off here. Once I get this into present mode. Yeah. Awesome. Um, hi everyone. Thanks so much for having us. Um, we're excited to share this uh, presentation with you all. I think um, it seems like the work that we're doing at Dr. Cog should overlap pretty well with what you're talking about here today. Um, so Byron and I are both um, GIS specialists for the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Um, so, and I apologize that uh, I know acronyms are not ideal for interpretation and our job title is one. So um, GIS is Geographic Information System. So we do a lot of work with spatial data. Um, so we are going to be presenting some thoughts and results we have from a project we've been working on for a few months, um, investigating the reliability of census data, especially as it pertains to mapping environmental justice demographics in our region. Um, and if you could hit next slide, Byron. 
Um, so a brief outline for you. Uh, we're going to be talking about the background of the project that we're doing on our side, um, as well as a background on some of the data sets that are involved, um, the translating the state definition that you are also are so familiar with into practice, um, as that does have implications for our organization as well. Um, and then we're going to be talking about how we investigated reliability, what that means, um, and what our statistical results are and what our geographic results are. And we have a bit of a um, demo of a dashboard that we made to, um, to share those results and we'll highlight some of the key takeaways. And then just to get started, a really brief background on the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Uh, we serve many different planning roles in the Denver region. So we're a council of governments, which means we serve as a forum for, for local member governments. Um, we're a regional planning commission. We're the federally designated area agency on aging, which focuses on older adults, as well as the metropolitan planning organization. Um, each of these roles cover slightly different boundaries, um, as you can see on the map there, but we typically um, are talking about everything contained in that outermost black boundary. Um, our member governments include the nine counties you see on the map here, excluding Weld County, as well as 51 municipalities. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Byron, who's going to tell us about um, census data and a lot of statistics. Great. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And thanks, everyone. I apologize. There's a heavy printer use going on behind me, but it should be all right. Um, so I just want to talk about the motivation for this project, which is based in Dr. Cog's environmental justice data set and analysis that we do. And so we have created this, this data set that defines environmental justice zones as the following. Any zone that has a percent of households in poverty that is above the regional average or um, that has a percent of minority population above the regional average. And so with, with that, it's a pretty simple data set, but we want to revisit our methods to see if there's a different definition that can better capture um, populations of interest and then potentially making an equity index, building in more variables and uh, demographic statistics. And then going further, how do we actually use that in analysis? Um, we provide funding for various transportation projects around our region. And so we wanna make sure that those are being distributed equitably across the populations that we serve. So the, um, that data set is based off of the American Community Survey, which many of you may already be familiar with, but this is a census product um, that samples 3.5 million households a year over a five year period. So for example, from 2015 to 2019 inclusive. And so this, um, they take all this data that they collect over that five year period and they build it into an estimate. And so this is, has better reliability than a one year estimate per se, because it's taking all those five years together rather than um, doing a single year. And so this data set is universally chosen by our peer organizations to do equity analysis because of that advantage and because um, it has more currency than the decennial census, which of course is only out every 10 years. And so the American Community Survey data that I just outlined, it, it provides data at different geographic levels. And so this is two of them. And again, this may be um, old news to some of you, but just to get us on the same page. So it produces that data at the tract level, which is simply a subdivision of a county or city and then it also produces it at a block group level, which is smaller. So subdivisions of tracts in that case. And so you can see here after the right, um, a map of Capitol Hill in Denver, and you can see the tracts here in purple and then the block groups that are smaller within those, within those tracts in blue. So this is just giving you a different view of a more rural area um, around Parker and east of it, so southeast of Denver, just how big tracts and block groups can get when you get into more rural areas. And the other thing um, we've been considering as we kind of reevaluate re our methods and our data is we want to follow Colorado S Senate Bill 260, um, which defines a disproportionately impacted community. And it does so 
by defining it as a census block group where these three conditions are true. And so for example, um, where a census block group has a proportion of households with median income less than or equal to 200% of the federal poverty line. I apologize, this is a lot, <laughs> but where that is, but where the proportion of those households is greater than 40%. And so this is a definition that's laid out in the language of the bill itself. However, we've found that there's some issues um, with that definition in this table here, you can see the, the description of that. So in the American Community Survey, AKA the ACS, there's only um, a distinguish, a dis this only distinguishes between households that are above or below the poverty line. It does not allow you to look at 200% of the federal poverty line. And then all, furthermore, that data is only reliable at the tract level um, in terms of accuracy. And I'll get into that in a minute. And so the alternative approach that our peers use and that we, we want to use is to use the population instead of households, which does allow you to get to that 200% of the poverty line um, level. The second one is uh, that's defined in the bill um, is a disproportionately impacted community has a proportion of households that identify as minority as greater than 40%. And the drawback to this, um, this is based on conversations we've had with, with others, is that survey respondent may not represent the entire household. They may say the household identifies as a minority or not, but that may not speak for those, um, those who are not answering. And so the alternative approach that is preferred um, is to use population again instead of households, and then to define it um, as a disproportionately impacted community as one where more than 40% of the population is minority. And then that bill does contain a third, this third um, criteria where proportion of households that are housing costs burdened is greater than 40%. And that is fine. There's no drawback in terms of the, the data. Um, and so no, no alternative is needed. And so the initial questions that we had um, was given these different options for definitions and scale, how reliable are ACS estimates? How accurate are they in general? And then does that reliability change significantly for different variables, different ways of translating that state, that state bill? Does it change when you go from block groups to tracts and change your geographic scale? And then does it change when you um, go from the 2015 to 2019 American Community Survey to the latest American Community Survey for 2016 to 2020? And so the way that we have examined reliability for the census data is by using the margin of error. And so, for example, um, I can go through an example that kind of explains what margin of error is here. If you look at this block group um, right here below Cheeseman Park, let's say that there's an estimate of the population below poverty level is 100, but it has a margin of error of 20. What that means is that there's a 90% likelihood that the actual population below poverty is between 80 and 120. So it's just the estimate plus or minus your margin of error gives you that confidence interval. And so the question is, is that is that good or bad? That's just a number. And so the way to kind of compare um, reliability of your data from block group to block group or track to track is to use something called a coefficient of variance measure. It's very fancy, but this is what the census recommends um, to come up with one number that tells you how reliable the data is. And so in this case, it's some simple math um, and you can forget all this as soon as I switch slides, but essentially you take uh, the margin of error, you divide it by this 1.645 to get standard error, which is just um, a measure of the variability of the data that went into forming the estimate in the first place. Then you take that standard error and you divide it by the estimate itself, which is in this case 100. And that gives you this number, this 0.12, which is your coefficient of variance score, which you'll see noted here as CV score. And so this allows you to compare reliability across block groups relatively. So for example, if you did that same process for all these block groups that you can see, actually the block group that we've had in question is fairly reliable compared to these other ones. In particular, this block group right on Cheeseman Park 
has very bad reliability. Um, the margin of error is very large compared to the estimate itself. And so getting into the actual results, the way that um, I've laid this out initially here is just with some histograms. So I just want to explain how to read these um, and interpret them. And so um, on the X axis of each of these graphs is a range of CV scores. And so this is just, again, the lower the score, the better the reliability, the higher the score, the worse the reliability based on that last slide. And on the Y axis is the number of blog groups that fall into each of those um, CV score ranges. And so, for example, there's nearly 1,200 blog groups that have a CV score of around 0.2 right here. And then I've drawn this red line on each of these graphs at an arbitrary threshold of 0.3 as a CV score. And this is just something we chose as a way to compare these different graphs. It gives you a reference point. So how much of the how much of the data is on the good side of that threshold and how much on the bad side is a way you can kind of start reading these. And then there's always going to be a dotted line here, which tells you the median CV score for the entire for the entire collection of block groups in our region, and that being the, the Dr. Cotton region, so not the entire state. And so this graph right here is looking at the total population estimate for all the block groups, and you can see that it's pretty reliable. Almost all of the block groups fall on the good side of that 0.3 threshold, and the median CV score is 0.13, which means that the margins of error are, are fairly low compared to the estimates themselves. So you'd expect that with total population because it's a large sample size. So getting into the, the results for um, specific variables, this slide has to do with um, percent minority estimates for different areas um, across our region. And so if you just focus on the top row right here, what you have is side-by-side um, -side comparison of block group reliability from uh, the two different years of the, of the American Community Survey data. So from 2019 and from the most recent release. And so you can see based on this on this top row that um, the reliability tends to be about half and half. Half of the block groups fall on the more reliable side of that 0.3 and then half are, are not so reliable based on our threshold. And then if you go down um, and compare that to the to the bottom row, which has to do with tracts, you can see that tract level data is just much more reliable. Almost all of the data for both years is falling um, on the good side of that arbitrary reliable threshold. Um, and you can see just comparing now the two columns and the two colors from 2019 to 2020, the 2020 data looks a little bit less reliable. Not terribly so, but just a little bit less reliable. Um, the next measure um, that I wanted to show was percent households below poverty level. So again, you can't distinguish 200% of the poverty level or 150% of the poverty level with households, it has to be just, is it below, yes or no? That's what the data the data has. And so you can see with this, just, just starting off with, again, that top row for blog groups, the reliability is not, is not good. It's not as good as it was just this one slide ago with percent minority. You can see how the median CV score is just, is just really high. And it, even for um, even for tracks, it's still a little bit rough. More than half of the, uh, the the tracks are on the bad side of that reliability reliability threshold um, for this percent households below poverty level. So if we take instead the other definition of poverty that we are proposing and that our peers often use, which is percent of the population below 200 percent of the poverty level, then your reliability starts to look a lot better. So if you look at the block groups again, um, the top row to start, things are looking a little better than it was for the household level. The reliabilities, median reliability, um, median CV score is looking better. And then for tracks, it's looking much better. More than half of the tracks are, are um, below that 0 0.3 threshold. And then finally, um, this other definition in that state bill, in that state um, Senate bill, was percent households that are housing costs burdened. So how confident can we be in that data? It, it also looks pretty good. It's similar to percent minority data where for block groups, about half the block groups are um, 
below that 0 0.3 thresholds and about half or above. And then it looks very, very reliable for um, tracts. You can really trust that data a lot more with pretty low CV scores across the board in both. Almost no tracts are, are above that 0 0.3 threshold for this particular variable. And so that's a lot of numbers and graphs and everything, but some of the key takeaways from that are, um, one is that tract data is more reliable than block groups. And that's that's makes sense because tracts, you're sampling more people. There are more people who live in tracts and so your sample size is larger. The second one is 2020 ACS data looks slightly less reliable than 2019. And that's something to just keep tabs on as perhaps the pandemic um, limited the accuracy of that 2020 data. And going forward, we might see a trend of worsening reliability. And as some variables are more reliable than others. So for example, that percent households below the poverty level is just not reliable at all. Some of those margins of error are as big as the estimate, um, which really means it could, it could almost be anything, just throw a dart. And the percent of population below twice the federal poverty level is, is more reliable and the most reliable poverty measure that you can get from, from, the, from the American Community Survey data. And then finally, aggregating variables increases accuracy, which just has to do with the last bullet point. If you just did population below poverty level, you wouldn't be as reliable as if you increased the number of people you're counting and included those who are twice the poverty level. So those are some takeaways, but um, now I can turn it back over to you, Rachel, and we can get into the dashboard. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so yeah, basically after we looked at kind of the general mathematical and numerical analysis of the block groups and their reliability, we also wanted to put it on a map and just see how it varied across the region. Um, and since block groups and tracks vary in size, we wondered, um, is it smart to exclude highly reliable block groups from our future analyses? But we didn't, we wanted to know how many does that mean we're excluding? Um, how large of a gap of gaps are we going to cr create? Um, and finally, we wanted to make sure that the areas we were most interested in focusing on, um, so those areas with high concentrations of vulnerable populations or um, DI communities, we didn't also con coincide with the areas of the highest um, unreliability in terms of the data. So I'm going to share my screen here. And I think, oh, okay. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see uh, that map dashboard. Um, okay, so first we're gonna focus on the top half of the dashboard. Um, what we did was set up some filters that allow us to filter the data by that CV score that um, Byron has been talking about. So if we set up um, going to that 0.3 number for each of the DI community variables, you can see that once we set up, like we're going to filter to the most reliable block groups only, it kind of erases a lot of the block groups in the whole region. So it's not really feasible for us to do a meaningful analysis with 500 out of the multiple thousands of block groups that we have. Um, tracks, on the other hand, which are bigger, do fare a bit better um, because, like we've been saying, they are more reliable overall, but there are still limitations to using tracks um, as opposed to block groups. Because they're bigger, you just get less detail on the geographic side. So like you can see in Adams and Arapaho counties, one track basically covers half of those counties. Um, so we can also use the filters to compare um, similar variables. Um, so like we've been doing in the past, our organization has used um, percent households below the poverty line, um, but we are considering switching that to the 200% um, based on the DI community definition. So you can see that the 200% poverty line measure leaves us with much uh, more block groups to work with. I apologize, I think my computer is being very slow. Um, but 
anyway. Um, and just keep in mind that when we're looking at the block groups here, we're looking at we're not looking at actual concentrations of um, poverty and people's income in relation to the poverty line. Um, this is just looking at the confidence value of each of those across space. So now if we look at the bottom half of the dashboard, we can look at how the variables vary across the region. So, hmm. Byron, I'm wondering if you could share the dashboard for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my computer is too slow. Uh, it's looking slow. All right, let me share it here. Yeah. Okay, you should be able to see it. Awesome, sorry about that everyone. And if you can toggle on the CVs across the region panel, I think we'll go there first. Sure. So basically on these maps, what we're looking at is um, the darker the blue, the more reliable the data in that block group for that measure. So total population is one of the most basic metrics the census provides. Um, and as we flip on and we can gradually turn off the other variables, it becomes easier to see where that reliability starts to go away. Um, so those, those are each of the um, DI community variables. And yeah, so minority tends to be more reliable or that measure at least from the census in terms of reliability. And then the poverty measures Again, we can see that same pattern of household, the household poverty measure is just less reliable overall than the 200% measure. So we also created some layers to compare the measure itself to the confidence value. Um, and so these maps are a little, a little funky to look at, but basically the blue block groups are those of higher concern with low reliability, yet high reported measures of poverty. So we're first looking at that percent households in poverty measure, which is one we've used in the past. Um, and same thing um, when we switch it to the 200% poverty line or less, there are fewer blue regions um, and fewer light orange regions and more areas that signify high reliability regardless of the measure. I know these maps are kind of weird to look at, um, but it did confirm for us that there isn't a strong spatial pattern of reliability or unreliability across the MET region. So kind of to wrap up here, some of the takeaways that we're taking um, to, in terms of back to our own equity projects, we've decided that we're probably not going to exclude block groups or tracks on the basis of reliability, just because it's really helpful to have a um, complete picture across the region, but we do plan to use it to help us select variables when we have options like we do with those poverty measures. We can also use this information to justify whether we're going to use the block group scale or a track scale. So for projects where reliability is more important than geographic detail, we can use this information to, um, to make that choice. And just some final thoughts on data visualization that I think will hopefully be relevant to your group um, is basically that many, many definitions of vulnerable or disproportionately impacted communities set thresholds um, for what constitutes that community in a region and whether it's setting it at above or below 40% of the block group or above or below the regional average, which is something um, a lot of planning organizations do we do recognize that um, to a certain extent, those thresholds can be arbitrary. No, neighborhoods and communities don't follow census boundaries, obviously. And I know that um, one of the talking points coming up on your agenda has to do with finding pockets of um, disproportionately impacted communities in um, larger in areas of affluence. So where they might not be showing up when you highlight it on a map, essentially. So we've done a little bit of exploration into alternate methods of visualizing data that go beyond, go beyond just highlighting a zone or not highlighting it. And a very po one popular method of doing that is using standard deviations or rankings, which I hate to 
throw more statistics into the conversation, but it does, it is helpful to have more of a gradient scale rather than a, a yes or no. Um, so this is just kind of an example of some something that uses that, so standard deviations. Um, so you get a little bit more nuance in that data. Um, and then one final thing is that um, some organizations are looking at using dot density. So this is where a dot on a map equals a certain number of people in that region. And so this is um, something that has been used, especially for that purpose of identifying where there are large numbers of a certain community, but not necessarily the concentration or percent that would, that would have it be highlighted under those threshold definitions. Um, so when you can compare um, the, those dot densities to the environmental justice zones that we've used in the past, you can kind of see where there are higher um, concentrations of dots, um, but not in a region that's been highlighted in the past. Um, so yeah, thank you all very much for having us present here today. We've really learned a lot um, on our own end of, about census data and reliability and especially data visualization. Um, and so we really appreciate the opportunity to present to this group. Um, your work does have a lot of meaning on what we're doing um, at our organization as well. Um, so if there are any questions, we would love to take them. Any questions or comments? Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm glad to know you all are in Dr. Cog doing the good work. Um, and you all are in the transportation department or? Uh, we're actually, we actually sit in the regional planning and development department, um, but this project that we're working on is really stemming from our transportation work, especially like the PIP, the Transportation Improvement Program um and our regional transportation plan so we do work very closely with them especially on this project yeah i see that with 260 i you know i had a chance down the stretch to force some things into 260 like the greenhouse gas rulemakings and the ej office so i'm just really impressed i'm kind of want to know what the heck you guys studied in school um <laughs> i know michael saps over there being like did i study this in school <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Byron and I mainly just we're the map the map nerds. We're just like <laughs> map and data. Um, but we've this I think we spend a lot of our time these days reading other um, reports of like peer reviews of organizations, uh, equity plans and their Title VI um, programs and things. So we're definitely learning a lot in the process. Sap, uh, do you have any questions? Tyson, do you have any questions? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, a lot, a lot of material to dissect, quite, on, quite frankly. Um, I appreciate what you all are doing. Um, and I, I look forward to uh, like really unpacking and doing my own homework and uh, being able to take what you all have shared to help inform how we uh, develop our recommendations. But this is great work. Um, and I commend the entire staff at Dr. Cog for uh, your due diligence um, and getting all of this data uh, in front of us this afternoon. But I don't have any questions right now, um, per se, um, but I, I probably will the next day or so. And I work with our staff to get those to you if I do. But thank you for your time this afternoon. A lot of rich data. I love the fact that you guys did the census tracks. We did that in my previous role with the Department of Safety, because track data, you're able to get like down to like the, the, the like 7,500 folk level um, or the, the, the neighborhood level um, and kind of see it, you know, on a, on a real micro level. So um, a lot of good data here. Uh, I took good notes and uh, we'll get back to you all and get back to the chair if I have any questions, but definitely will help me as we develop recommendations for our, our DIC subcommittee. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I know it is a lot of uh, technical in the weeds information and I, yeah, I appreciate the chance to talk and definitely um, send, us, uh, send us any questions. I can post our emails in the chat.
Yeah, thank you guys very much. That that was uh, very interesting and very informative. Um, I just have one last question. I know, Joel, that we got to move on to our next topic before public comment, but you're in our shoes. What recommendations do you make, given the fact that you built all these maps? Yeah, um, I think the the most direct thing I would say is that the definition, like the very detailed parts of the definition for the three aspects of the communities, they just, they slightly don't line up with how the data is actually available. So everybody that's going to try to meet this definition is going to be doing something slightly different. So I feel like the first thing to do would just be I acknowledge that the goal would obviously be to use household income and household poverty status, but at the block group level, which the, the, the law defines, it's just not possible. So if it just says you can use exactly this, I think from a data standpoint, it makes the process just much more direct and with less room for human error, basically less room for translating that bill into a data set. Um, so I think those little things, um, yeah, just that, you know, the, yeah, basically that income one is a little bit, we have to do a little bit of translation to get it into the data. Um, so that seems like the easiest thing um, from my perspective. Byron, do you have anything to add there? No, that's exactly the, I guess the main, the main thing is that those definitions like, yeah, they matter a lot for like us. <laughs> um, the other the other thing is like the whole reliability thing, the tracks versus block groups. Like if you, we're trying to come up with recommendations for, for Dr. Cog itself. And basically our recommendation is, yeah, you can use block groups, um, but if you need the data, if you need to be more confident and more I don't know, more confident in the data numbers themselves than use tracts. And so it's kind of like the trade off between getting more granular, specific location locations on a map versus zooming out, um, but getting better uh, reliability with the numbers. So it's going to depend, I guess, on like how that looks from your end, but we're trying to grapple with that too. Yeah. And I guess the last thing I would say is I, I know that there was another um, part in your next conversation about adding um, additional like demographic variables to the minority and cost burden and um, poverty. And that's something where we've been looking at a lot as well. A lot of different um, environmental justice analysis analyses will include um, the older adult population or youth or no car households or any number of things. And I guess I would just say that the research we've done does say you do have to balance how many variables you add because you don't wanna detract attention from the ones that you've identified as the most important. Um, so that's something we didn't talk a lot about today, but I know something that, that may be relevant to you and something we've been doing a lot with. Well, I would be really open to some written recommendations for us to mull over and to share with people, if you could, that we could also um, send along. Um, and then I was just looking at the website. Is, is this uh, interim director? Is, Ashley, is that your boss? Because I think we should yeah. send her a letter uh, saying you guys are kicking butt. Because I know <laughs> what it's like to work in the government and not get the kudos. And when you get the kudos, it helps to get you raised. So I just, uh, I think... Joel, if you can just remind us to do that, I think we should send a note along from our committee and just say thank you. Well, thanks. I really appreciate it. And yeah, I can talk to Ashley as I well. I oh, sorry. I second that. No, I second that. I, and I was a poli sci major too. Uh, so you, you can only imagine. Uh, great information. I second what Ian said. Great work, and the director should note all the work that you guys are doing. Uh, we we hear that as as your staff, Ian and, and Michael, and I think we can definitely work on that thank you letter. And, and Rachel and, and Byron, thank you so much for sharing. And 
you know, while, while you're still here, I, I know you've all spent a lot of time with us, but, but Ian, if, if this makes sense to you, I, I feel like this is a great segue into the, the next agenda item. And I am curious, you know, as the task force, having just heard this, um, it seems like there are some kind of concrete recommendations we just heard for relatively small changes in, in components of the definition that we, we have on the agenda to discuss. So thinking about the, the income definition using sort of not a household percentage of, of households at or below 40%, but just using percentage of the census block group population, for example. Do you wanna just go directly into that conversation and, and start brainstorming recommendations? That That's certainly an option if we wanna just segue there directly while we still have, have Rachel and Byron here to, to answer questions. I'll be honest, I don't know if I've like processed what I just heard um, enough to like make recommendations out of it. Um, back to the part about like the 200% of federal poverty line, that was the one that really triggered me because coming from city policy work, we so often use those kind of definitions um, for social service programs. And, you know, I'm wondering if that makes sense or, or not as well. I, I don't know. Robin, you're, you do lots of data and stuff. We haven't heard much from you. Like, I'm really interested in what your mind's thinking right now. Um, thanks, yeah. I um, was on another meeting for the first part, but I caught the last 20, 30 minutes um, of the discussion, which was, and I totally co-signed the sending a letter of gratitude and appreciation for the presentation we just heard. Um, and also as a government employee, like anything you can do to give people kudos is awesome, but like big LOL at the raises concept. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not a thing. <laughs> um, you know, at least not for uh, state agencies so much, but um, uh, I, I would like to process, like, I don't know if I can translate what I just heard into recommendations. I did, however, like, look at the discussion items on the agenda and try to brainstorm, you know, but they're, the stuff that I, I brought prepared to talk about doesn't incorporate, right, some of what we just heard is sort of where my head's at. I still would, I wanna like read through the presentation again and think about it and, um, you know, maybe put Rachel and Byron on the spot if we have some follow-up questions, like would you be willing to make yourself available even, so. Yeah, I, I think Baron and I are planning to stay for the rest of the meeting and would definitely be happy to provide any answers to questions or input that you all would like. Okay, Joel, well, it sounds like we'll go back to the list. Um, do you mind reading them? You want me to read them? I yeah, well, maybe I'll go ahead and, and share my screen. Thank you so much again, Rachel and Byron. Um, I'm just sharing my screen with the agenda in it um, that has kind of just a, a list of questions that we have brainstormed. Um, these are questions that relate to the different presentation um, topics, or, or sorry, recommendation topics. Um, that's kind of a, a condensed version, really, of, of the list that, that we presented to you on, on Saturday. and. You probably remember from from Saturday's meeting that you know in the the list that Lubna created of, of sort of outstanding questions that need to be answered. Um, still, in order for us to start shaping recommendations, this subcommittee definitely we've done a really good job of identifying a lot of really targeted questions, um, but we haven't sort of started flagging as many of the answers maybe as some of the other subcommittees. So. Um, hopefully we can start that process today and, and start seeing if there's um, preliminary consensus or just individual ideas that exist around the answers to some of these questions around how we could change the definition and, and whether we should change the definition. Um, and then where we still have more work to do, like, you know, kind of realizing we need some time to process what we just heard about kind of micro changes to the, the race and, and income and housing cost burden factors and the definition. That will give us a sense of what we should do as your EJ unit staff to kind of get the discussion ready for our next subcommittee meeting and hopefully be in a better position to answer more, more of the questions. So I, I have the list on my screen and um, we can go in order if folks kind of have thoughts. I mean, we just 
talked about the census data reliability question and maybe you don't want to start there. Or task force members can jump in wherever you're ready. Um, yeah, could I want. maybe um, try to suggest that we zoom out of the, the weeds on these particular bullets and talk more about the first some of like the bigger questions like let's take everybody's sort of temperature on I think maybe and this is just a suggestion but like things like do we you know do we think there needs to be a change right and you know maybe straw survey and we can talk about why and then I think the larger question I think the for me one of the more critical questions is like do we allow for age different agencies to have different definitions or like do we do does every agency need to use all of their criteria or do agencies need to call out the criteria that's maybe more specific to their work and do, I, I would really appreciate just hearing from everybody about like some of those bigger issues maybe before we get into the weeds on some of these like sub bullets if, if folks are willing And I'm happy to go first, but I don't want to monopolize the conversation. But um, well, you haven't spoke much, so I think you're more than welcome to jump in. Um, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, no, I was said nobody ever, by the way, to me. <laughs> you know. Um, so, and apologies, my kids just got home, so it's noisy. Um, you know, I, I um, really sort of appreciate that, like if we're gonna make recommendations that the concept of disproportionately impacted community and like ensuring additional protections and engagement and which I, um, you know, I think we wanna do everybody is we need to think about the, and I know I sound like a broken record, like the span of control of the agencies and the purposes that they serve and whereas maybe with the equity analysis, we are we are needing to de-silo a lot, right? And look at cumulative impacts. Here is a place where, you know, the agencies are trying to target to have the maximum impact, right? And so um, it seems to me that like it would make sense to develop a definition that can be uh, addressed to the needs of the communities served by the purpose of the agency, if that makes sense. Like we would want the air agency to be targeting the air, the communities where the reductions are gonna have the most impact. And then we would want the water agency to do it the same thing. And then we would want maybe the transportation agency or the energy office, right, to do the same thing. And that's not the same communities for all the agencies. So, um, you know, I think we can still do that by having a single definition and statute if we're mindful about the criteria and the mixes, right, and the use of ands versus ors, right, those sorts of things, because I think it'll be really important to have in statute the things that the agencies need to look at Right. Um, so th that's my uh, that's my thought. And then I think it would behoove us. It just really irks me on a personal level when we use the same term to mean two different things. And so to the extent we have a, all of these state agencies or even local governments following our lead or, you know, and like looking at impact on communities and we've collectively decided as a state to use the nomenclature disproportionately impacted community, right? That we should recommend that this apply to the work of all agencies and that everybody should use our definition to the extent possible, right? And so that's my sort of thought process. You know, Robin, I think your perspective makes a lot of sense because you're in CDPHE. Um, and your agency is responsible for the operations and the implementation of the laws that get passed. 
Um, I'm, I'm certainly open to each agency that has a certain area, having that definition kind of meet the criteria of that agency. Um, me, me personally, I, I think, uh, I think that's how it should be. Um, but I guess I'll stop there. I mean, I, I think, um, I think that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I'll stop there. I have a lot that I want to say, but um, I just give me some more time to think on it and move on. And I'll just, I'll just like, I, I and, shoot them and, in I, and I got, a, I got two months in my arm. I got a two month in my arm, so I'm trying to play oh. daddy and stay <laughs> focused and feed, and I'm, I'm just having a moment. Yeah, Ian I mean, knows I'll, what time it is. Just roll with it and be like, you know, like, so if, if the statute, you know, said like, these are, we take from what we learned today, um, putting aside for the moment the specifics of what they are, like the criteria that are going to help us accurately identify the communities. Um, and we know like if we look, use, let's say there's five of them, right? And we know, so the health department, we would say like, which ones do we want agencies undertaking environmental regulation to focus on, right? We would say, we want you to focus on at least these two, right? And then agencies looking at um, agencies who have control over more like economic type activities, right? So for example, I don't know that, you know, PUC, right? And we have Kelly here, so please save me from going totally sideways. Um, you know, we want you to focus on A and you know, the economic piece, because like the cost of power, right, for those people who are economically burdened is so critical. And right. And so then we want, you know, agencies with, you know, different interests, and maybe we need to identify this first set of agencies, we would want this to apply to and for the ones that don't have rules already addressing disproportionately impacted communities like I don't know if that's within our span of control to say these agencies should, but to the extent they do, we can draft the, um, you know, the definition to be like, here are the things, you know, when you're looking at when within your statutory authority, like we want you to consider at least, we would have the language at least, which allows them to consider other ones as applicable. Um, you know, I guess that's, that's what I'm thinking. I, I automatically go to how would I do this, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, write, writing statutory language is very hard. Uh, and, and I'd agree, Robin, um, you know, in the experience of working with multiple agencies for regulation and permitting, probably the most frustrating thing is having two different definitions to deal with. Um, because it does not give you any um, any clear sighting on either side of what what should be the um, the governing piece. So so from a from a consistency standpoint, I think that's really important. Um, but also the applicability standpoint is also very important because you're going to run into those situations again um, where you're talking about utilizing the same definition and you have the uh you have the risk of including more than should be included or excluding more than should be included and the perfect example was the one given earlier of whether you you know talking about environmental notification versus talking about appropriations of funds for uh, environmental projects or or seps or or other things so um that's where I feel like we need to really get into the gritty on things. Um, but from a from a consistency standpoint, I am one that believes we should be starting from square one. And, uh, and you know, you, you start from square one, understanding that there are going to be situations that need to be handled different. 
you set the groundwork, you set the framework and make sure that everything that operates operates within that framework for the for the purpose that serves it. I think you said something that makes a lot of sense and that's kind of creating a framework and having consistency among the different agencies that, that are required to have um, DI components um, and EJ requirements as well. But I mean, just speaking and I, and I, I wanna be very clear, I was appointed uh, as a person of color. And so my comments today have been on just me as an African-American who grew up on the east side and lived in Montbello Green Valley Ranch, but putting on my Excel Energy hat on just for a quick second, we touch multiple state agencies, right? Like we're regulated by the PUC, but we have electric vehicle or TEP goal, transportation electrification plan. Um, we're trying to get, you know, like 1.5 million EVs across our, our, our operating companies. Um, and so, um, but I, I think having some level of consistency is good. Um, but I, I think starting off there, but I, again, I go back to the engagement um, and, and what's the audience that we're, we're trying to set these, these, uh, this framework for and getting their input on this as well. So I hear you. So Michael, are you saying like, there's a concern that like, if we, if we try to say different agencies, everybody's working from the same definition, but different agencies might identify different communities as disproportionately impacted. That could be more challenging for a company like Excel that works across agencies because they would have to look at different communities in the context of different things that they're doing. That's sort of what I was hearing. Yeah, I, I don't, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's just information sharing and, and, and being able to have a conversation and a dialogue around the definitions and the application. Um, so I, I, I don't, I just think it's more information share or, or communication versus the challenge. I think that, and just speaking on behalf of Excel, I, I think that we have the capacity to meet the requirements. Um, we just, we just, we don't know what we don't know yet because we're, we're in that process of developing those definitions. And so, um, but I, I, but again, I, I think that um, I, I want to be be mindful though that while Excel is here, people call it here. I I want to make sure that the people of color and and those that have been disproportionately impacted that their voices are are kind of swayed <clears throat> a little higher because they've had to live with these injustices uh, for quite some time. But I also get Tyson's point. It's a it's a tough conversation because. I get the application and I get the operational and the, the funding and the FTEs, full-time employees, uh, and the need to, like, do you have staff to do this? So it's a delicate conversation. And, and coming from the city where I did operational excellence, I tried to do that. I get the challenge, Robin, that you and CDPG and others are going through because this is hard. Um, and I recognize that. Sorry to interrupt you. No, you're fine. I, I mean, are you thinking like, um, like we have a definition in statute and then agencies could add like internal agency def, you know, through a public process, like through engaging the community for so, um, is that, I mean, is that, is that where, is that what you were thinking when you were talking about like so. elevating the communities? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. You have an authentic community engagement. Um, one that that um, is 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 everything that we're talking about, right? After hours on Saturday, bilingual, um, focusing on those census tracts, but also having a space for industry and business to weigh in as well. Um, and, and we can figure out those methodologies 
like if we just cheer it out and kind of figure this out because this is a long game it's not a short game um but i i think that you i think we're tracking i think that you and i are saying the same thing Well, and, and I think another Am I way to. You? Robin? Yeah. Are we. Are yeah, you I, know, I, I do. I yes, this? sorry. I was muted. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I think one of the. One of the no, one of the big um, pieces to that is exactly what you said, Michael, is, is how does it really apply and, and, and how how do you avoid unintended consequences, not from a community side, from, you know, something Ian said earlier about damaging people's property values by, you know, creating this uh, disproportionately impacted community around a community that, that maybe does not want that. And how do you how do you adjust for that? There has to be some some way to allow that public input. I don't think we necessarily have the time to hear from all the communities and hear testimony from, you know, community leaders and businesses and industries and, and all that stuff to actually create that. So how do we how do we put forth the best definitions that we can with recommendations that definitions along those lines be used? For consistency purposes, in an in a manner that's appropriate, and, and and in line with whatever regulatory agency's process there is, because again, some agencies have to, you know, have a bill passed. Some agencies have to have a, a an open, um, you know, rulemaking process, and other agencies can make changes on the fly. So how that all gets implemented is the implementation piece again it's like you can have a great idea but if it's not implemented right it could turn out really wrong so tyson let me just see if i can translate that um from from my my own understanding so michael and i were talking about how you need to have an on-ramp that right like there's a definition that we start with and then there needs to be an on-ramp for communities to be engaged and say like no look at us like we don't meet your criteria, but like we've been impacted in this way. And, um, and what I heard you saying was that there may be communities that want an off ramp, right? And they're worried about, and I apologize if this is like the wrong terminology, but like they're worried about a stigma. And I was thinking back to, you guys remember the um, Gold King spill, right? The mine spill a few years ago that community, like my understanding is EPA had been trying to designate that community a Superfund site for years, but the community didn't want to be designated a Superfund site because they were worried about like, you know, sort of the connotation and things that came along with it, even though it meant federal dollars for cleanup, right? And so I think they are now in light of the spill, but are, Tyson, were you sort of getting at communities that are like, you know, this is, this is not for us. This is not what we want. We may meet the criteria, but you know, we, we self-govern and like, we're not interested in your extra state attention or am I like totally misunderstanding what you were saying? Well, yeah. And, and I guess, I guess, again, the devil's in the details, right. Of how things are defined. But if you for for instance, utilizing two hundred percent of uh, of the poverty line in a community that may um, have a, have a lower cost of living and maybe they don't want to be considered a DI community, um, you know, there are there are things that could help their community and there are things that that could hurt their community as well, depending on what their demographics are, how they're growing, um, and and also rural versus urban. There's a lot of different things. I mean, you know, you talk you talk about uh, there are a lot of farmers out there who, you know, they 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 get by every year um, just enough, but that's the life they love they 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 lead and love and and 
they may not want uh, to be designated a, a, a disproportionately impacted community. Because I, I like have know. rarely found that communities are uniform in how they feel about stuff like that. Yeah. Right. right. And so we, as the right. health department, deal with communities all the time, especially with oil and gas regulation, where there's a number of people in the community, often the people who are governing that community and, you know, who say like, we don't wanna be subject to additional regulation like our, and then there's the people who are, you know, saying no, like we've been impacted, like we're the ones you need to protect. We don't have the political voice to protect ourselves. And so yeah, I'm, absolutely. it's so challenging. Yeah. That, that, that's what I'm saying. And, and how do you do that across the board on, on all agencies? That's the question that I have. I, I just, I'm, I am, I'm not saying there is a solution or there is an easy solution. I would be more apt to say, Hey, you know, in using this personally impacted communities, you have to use, you know, here's the, here's the framework for the, the top things that, that we recommend they should use, like, IE, you know, whatever it is i'm i'm using it as an example not saying that's the right answer but 200 percent uh um of of the poverty line being that number that's used to um define low income uh you know come up with those groundworks for those main those main themes and then come up with how things should be defined in regards to uh, a racially um, um, or, or, or a community impacted by um, environmental racism, how that should be defined on its individual piece, and then how each, and then make sure that each regulatory agency goes through their appropriate process to implement those to the best of their abilities. I mean, again, you know, I, I think the CDPHE has a has a much different course of action um, than let's say even the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. You know, they're supposed to, they're 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 protecting public health, safety, and welfare. CDPHE has another level of that. CDPHE has to, um, you know, find ways to uh mitigate eliminate um and and improve prove existing uh situations which i think is is you know can have many different connotations as it comes to a to a definition so i'm saying it sounds really easy just to say hey we're gonna have one definition but when you think about it in practicality um and use of appropriations versus the use of notification versus the use of regulation it, it, it can get really uh really gray really quick joel if if different agencies used criteria to establish like have a public process to identify the disproportionately impacted communities um, that they're going to use in in doing their work. Can EnviroScreen add a layer like that's as long as we're all using the same like normative terms like census block or tract or whichever one we use and like we're all using the same sort of numeric like poverty level numbers, right? So that we're only collecting that set of data. Is it ultimately possible to overlay like this is the air division communities, right? Or this is the water division communities, or maybe it's all of CDPHE. I don't, not trying to presume, right? But this would be COGCC DI communities. Is that a functionality that's possible with an EnviroScreen? Yes, is the short answer. Um, so one, I'll just, I'll start by saying for those of you who aren't familiar with it on the call, Colorado EnviroScreen is our new interactive environmental justice mapping tool that we are developing. It's currently in beta testing. I, I just shared a link where you can go check it out for beta testing. We'll, we'll be beta testing through Saturday, actually is the end of the, the term. So please share your input. 
Robin, I, I'm going to just screen share the beta version and, and kind of show you. So, you know, we do actually have different layers already built in, and we, we could do something like that to either show different definitions for different agencies. So, so here I'll, I'll just turn on the current CDPHE demographic definition that what we heard about, which is also the same as the current um, CDOT definition that, that we heard about from Byron and, and Rachel earlier, right? So we have a layer for that. And then we, we actually also you know have a layer for the federal government's definition on, under Justice 40. Um, you know, we could build in additional layers that would be like Public Utility Commission, Water Quality Control Commission, or even alternatively, here is just income at or below 200% of the federal poverty line. Here is more than 40% people of color and, and allow sort of mixing and matching that way as well. So I, I think there's a lot of functionality that we could build into EnviroScreen if we go the route that you all are, are talking about to um, basically make it possible for people to easily understand where we're talking about if, if different agencies are choosing to apply different criteria in different contexts. So I'll, I'll pause there and see if I answer the question and happy to answer follow-ups as well. Uh, yeah, you, you answered my question. And the reason I was asking is because I wouldn't want us to go down a route that like doesn't make our tool useful, right? I think it's critically important to think about how we incorporate EnviroScreen into, um, you know, making it, sure that people can understand if they're in a DI community and that sources can understand if they're in a DI community, um, that tool is gonna to be critical. So I wouldn't want us to get too far down the path um, of thinking about things in a way that the tool can't accommodate. So thank you. Thank you, Robin. And I'll just add it, you know, perhaps a thing that you can consider that, that we've kind of posed as one of the questions that we've talked about in past meetings is whether an area's enviro screen score could be among the sort of suite of, of factors that an agency considers in its definition. So, you know, an area with a 90th percentile score in enviro screen, for example, you know, we've done a lot of work to build a lot of different indicators into the tool that sort of come together to say, yes, an, an area above 90 percentile in, in EnviroScreen is likely disproportionately impacted, right? There are demographic factors, um, sensitive populations, environmental exposures, climate vulnerability, environmental effects that are all coming together in that one place. And so, you know, in addition to the ability to map different layers in EnviroScreen that, you know, I think the enviro screen score itself could be part of what what feeds into an agency's definition but that is of course a, a decision for you all to make in in your recommendations yeah and, and and on that on that note i mean the enviro screen in my opinion is a great starting point but there's we have way too diverse of a community in colorado and uh and diverse uh, uh you know water sources and diverse uh, you know the west slope versus versus the 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 front range versus um there's just a lot of issues that i see making that the end all be all i think that viral is a great way to start um and to make a recommendation that if you know you fit into something uh, uh some portion of the di community on viral screen then um you know then the regulatory agency needs to take a closer look and create no more notice and create more public involvement. Um, my only, I guess in my only, this may bring us to a separate conversation that's not really related to the de definition itself, but I'm still not clear. Oh no. Tyson, we can't hear you if you're talking still. That data really means, um, and I'll give you an example of VOCs. Are we talks, you know, VOCs are something that are measured, but they're not measured. Uh, you know, VOCs can include a realm of things, including, uh, you know, some very harmful toxins. And also things that are, are much less har harmful than those than those toxics. So what are we talking about? And each area is gonna be different. Commerce City is gonna be a heck of a lot different than VOCs that are seen 
um, you know, in a rural area, um, you know, the impacts a little differently. So, so I, I'm curious to know exactly how Enviro Screen is going to be utilized. I think it's a great starting point. I think it's a great identifier, but I don't think it's it's going to be very hard for me to understand how we're going to write a rule or a recommendation around the use of a single tool. I think I'm leaning more towards of use that tool to identify the starting point of a larger, broader conversation. And that would be the recommendation. Tyson, you, you cut out for part of that, but I, I think we still understood the, the gist. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know that we're, we're suggesting that EnviroScreen is, the best or, or only tool, you know, I, I guess what I would put back to you all, because this is not us making the decision as your staff, right? This this has to come from the task force, is that you know, we 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 hope we've created EnviroScreen in a way that it is useful for identifying areas that meet the cumulative impacts prong of the definition. So it's it's not just talking about volatile organic compounds. So there is a, a measure of that built in through. The, the air toxics indicator. It's not just talking about water quality. It's, it's literally every type of environmental issue aggregated together, which, which was our best stab at coming up with something that could be used to think about those cumulative impacts. But but ultimately, whether cumulative impacts are a factor that, that should be considered at, at all, um, in the definition of disproportionately impacted community is a question for you all, right? Like maybe given the, the wide range of things that has to be considered and, and that it's different for every agency, maybe that's not the best thing. So I'll just leave it there. I, and, have, a, I have a thought and I just, I know we're getting close to like break time and public comment, but if I don't say it, I'm gonna lose it because like two children brain um, is, you know, we were, I thought the meeting on Saturday was, you know, the discussion about the equity analysis and how do we look at cumulative impacts is so great. And then I'm thinking like, okay, well, so what do we use these tools for and these definitions? And if we're looking, you know, we're using EnviroScreen to identify, you know, areas that are cumulatively impacted, does that then lead to the equity analysis subcommittee and like them conducting or recommending that be conducted like a you know, cumulative impacts analysis of specific areas, right? And then like that analysis would inform a, in turn like the DI community definition or what I'm saying is like, do we have to be taking into account like how and where cumulative impact analyses are conducted in taking that cumulative impacts into account in the definition? And so I, I that's a big question in my mind. And so I'm wondering if, like if we could maybe have a like a sub like a crossover subcommittee something with them to like talk about or how do we like how do we do that Joel like how do we think about how these these two works right two committees might intersect because or maybe this is a question for like Ian and Tyson and Michael like this committee like do we do we want to focus on areas that have been identified by EnviroScreen as cumulatively impacted, or do we want to focus on areas that are studied, um, you know, as cumulatively impacted and use that? Um, and because I think we, well, I think we have to look at cumulative impacts, right? So I just. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of your, you hit on exactly what I was saying is EnviroScreen gives us tips us off to, hey, this is an area that may have impacts that are greater uh, to, to a disproportionately impacted community, that in my mind would immediately kick off something like a, a, an equity study or an equity analysis. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but I think, yes, I think are the recommendation for the, for the definition needs to include a recommendation on how to implement that de definition, which may include an equity analysis. 
to say, hey, if Enviro screen shows something at or near this, then we should take a closer look at it. And and where that goes is saying, you know, Enviro screen's only going to be so up to date on so many things. At some point, you got to take a closer look. When you take a closer look, you're going to be able to say, you know what? Enviro screen was a little off. Maybe we can make some adjustments at that point and you use that analysis to to improve our, our data. Or it may be. I mean, I was thinking like it will tell us like this community is burdened by toxics, right? Um, and not ozone. And so I'm just, again, I'm like, okay, well, that tells me, that tells my agency what I need to do to protect that community, right? Yeah, exactly. But it also is going to lead other agencies, whether to their, whether they're going to approve or not approve projects. And, you know, it may be a, you know, I, I really don't know how to, you know, it may have a, a cumulative impact study and that realizes that, okay, this is going to, you know, um, slightly raise this, but have a better impact than not doing this. And I mean, you know, you can use anything for that example of uh, sewage plants or things that are necessary for population growth that you have to do. Um, and it may change the siting of that particular project because of the impacts that are noticed initially on EnviroScreen and then later through a more impactful equity analysis that says, yeah, you can't do that here because the equity analysis shows this. Um, I think I might want to pause and just interject for a second. I think we're getting pretty deep down into a discussion of, of equity analyses, which, which is great. Um, and we're um, maybe Tyson and, and Michael, you can bring that conversation to the, the, the equity analysis subcommittee tomorrow, right? Um, but I, I do think that um, you know, your ideas are important in, in how we use EnviroScreen as a, a screening tool, which is what it literally is, is you know, a key part of the equity analysis. Um, but I, I wanna make sure we're not losing to focus too much because um, we are now kind of quite a bit behind agenda. We, we've lost um, Ian, so I, I've texted him. I'm, I'm guessing he's having internet or connectivity issues because I haven't heard back from him and he, he hopped on a little bit. But um, I just, just wanna kind of pause and maybe see if what the task force members think um, we're okay wrapping up this discussion um, and maybe kind of being clear on what our directions for staff are, what, what we should do based on this conversation before the next meeting so that we can then um, transition into the, the public comment. Um, and, and if there isn't public comment, we can also just continue the discussion, but wanted to see what Robin, Michael, Tyson, you, you think about that. Yeah, I mean, that that's definitely go to public comment and um, you know, I, I'm sad we lost Ian. I'd really love to hear like his perspective on, on these things. Um, but, uh, yeah. And because I can't think in the abstract, I'm going to try to put some pen to paper in advance of our next meeting. Just, I would, I would encourage everybody to do it, but like, that's just how my brain works. And so just to sort of start seeing if I can work through the puzzle of how to incorporate some of the things we talked about today, if that's okay. And, um, you know, share that with Joel, who can share it with others. If, if for discussion, right, it's probably going to be garbage the first attempt. So just, you know, know that. I, I think let's move this transition to public comment. I do want to spend some time kind of just dissecting the presentation from Dr. Todd, this conversation. Um, but I, I certainly think that uh, a lot of our subcommittees kind of work together. And so it's just, it's just kind of hard, but let's get the public comment. Sorry, I got to. Great. Thanks. I think we just got Ian back. So um... sorry about that, y'all. My internet just tanked out on me. No problem. We we floundered without you. No, um, we're, we, I think, managed to kind of wrap up the conversation. And, and um, Robin, I. Um, I really appreciate your offer of putting pen to paper and we would love to work with you on that as the EJ unit staff. I was gonna 
suggests the same thing that maybe the next step is that we, I think, heard a lot today that we could at least start sketching out um, a, a framework of that that you all mentioned and what that would look like to at least have a, a discussion point for for next time and. Um, we'd love to work with you on that and, and can obviously as, as your staff kind of individually coordinate with each of the task force members consistent with open meetings law. Um, so Robin, maybe you and I can can connect after this meeting and, and think about what who will do what by when and set some deadlines and have, have something written down for everyone to look at at the next meeting. That'd be great. Thank you. You, you. you just sign me up too. I'm happy to throw some notes in there as well and help contribute if you all we will thank you michael yeah I'll, I'll probably be following up with each of the subcommittee members individually and including renee who's, who's not here tonight and, and yeah just work on that as, as well as following up with each of the agencies who might be implicated individually um to kind of get their their input as well um so ian i think with that we we have i think a decent number of members of the public still with us and um, we can turn it over to public comment. I'll I'll kind of defer to the, the task force members and, and Ian on whether you want to take a break first. We did have a break on our agenda, but we're we're a little behind schedule. So I want to just check check what you all want to do. Do we know is there anyone in the audience that wants to speak? Because I feel like if so, I'd rather power through for them. And if not, maybe we take a break and see if anyone else joins on in the last 15 minutes. Maybe put up your hands, um, Caitlin, Rachel, Byron, um, Kelly, Susan, Tammy, if any of you would like to, to speak up, please, please just raise your hand in the Zoom or, or, or join in. Yeah, we very much would love to hear what you have to say and any thoughts you might have from watching. But Byron, please go ahead and, and unmute and, and share your thoughts. Thanks, Joel. Um, yeah, I don't know how useful this is going to be, but just really quick, just to give you an idea of like how we at Dr. Cog um, have used definitions that have either been discreetly defined as you must use this definition and analyze against it versus like in-house definitions. Like we have federal requirements to define environmental justice zones in our region as those that have a high level of poverty and a, and a high amount of um, people of color living in a census um, block group. And those are like defined as, you know, you must define it this way. And so we do have that, but then we also are pondering like in-house, like for our own needs for transportation equity purposes, creating our own data sets. So, I don't know if that's useful, but that's just one way that we kind of handle that idea of like, there is a standard that is set for us, but then we go beyond to tailor something to like what we need. So just to give you an idea. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or want to continue that part of the conversation? Ian, I don't hear anything, but I, I do see the, the chat from, from Caitlin. Um, so, so Caitlin, I'll, I'll try to verbally answer your question and then see if any of the task force members want to elaborate, if, if that's all right. Um, and the answer is yes, um, in short. So the Environmental Justice Action Task Force um, is, is told by the Environmental Justice Act, um, House Bill 21-1266, to consider making recommendations about the definition of, of disproportionately impacted community that applies to um, uh, currently just the Air Quality Control Commission, but also considering whether um, the same definition should apply essentially to other agencies as, as well. There, there are currently slightly different definitions that apply to the Colorado Department of Transportation, Public Utilities Commission, Colorado Parks and Wildlife and Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. So um, that's a 
maybe too complicated of an answer, but, but the short answer to your question is yes. And um, the subcommittee of the task force is really focused on that question of what should the definition of disproportionately impacted community be for, for state agencies in, in general and you know, sort of specifically, um, at least the Air Quality Control Commission, but potentially others as well. Well, hi, this is Susan Perkins. I, I really applaud the conversation today, but here's my question. It seems to me that at the PUC, this will require a rulemaking that will be preceded by, by engagement. Are there other agencies that will anticipate rulemakings? And then what is the relationship between the findings of the uh, Environmental Justice Action Task Force and the actions of the Environmental Justice Advisory Board relative to those rulemakings? Will those entities be weighing in? Um, what are your thoughts about that, Joel? I'm, I'm happy to answer and um, also want to see if other task force mem if, if task force members, not, not staff, would like to try to answer as well. Um, and of course, we're, we're fortunate to have Kelly Crandall from the Public Utilities Commission here. Um, but it, Susan, I, I think the answer to your, your first question is, is yes. Um, so, you know, the task force can make recommendations about statutory changes. So, so it can make recommendations to the, the legislature. Um, or to agencies essentially through the, the governor's office. Um, and those could require a, a rulemaking to implement them by an agency. So certainly the, the Air Quality Control Commission at, at some point will, will have to have a rulemaking to, to choose and, and implement a definition of disproportionately impacted community to, as Robin can speak to far better than I can, it, it has already done so to, to some extent with the December 2021 oil and gas rulemaking. And, I think that would likely be the same for the Public Utilities Commission, either if it ends up um, working more to, to implement it, its current definition and statute, or if there ends up being a statutory change that, that gets made based on a recommendation of the task force. Um, I, I think what I was hearing maybe earlier, um, Robin and Michael and Tyson discussing is that one option for the task force to recommend is that there be sort of a, a suite of criteria in, in a statute, pr presumably in the Administrative Procedure Act, where, where the current definition is, that could be then implemented by different state agencies in rulemaking processes separately, where agencies could take the criteria that work for them, but, but not the criteria that don't, um, and then implement that through a, a rulemaking that, that would then sort of apply in their specific context. Um, that's my lawyerly paraphrase of what I, I think I heard Robin and Michael saying earlier. So Robin or Michael, please, um, way in if I'm, I'm wrong there. Um, and then just really quickly to answer the last part of your question before we see if Robin or, or Michael or, or Kelly have anything they wanna say, um, you know, that I think whatever definition the task force recommends will, will very likely be the one that the, the advisory board implements. And you know, the, the, the key thing that the environmental justice advisory board will, will do with the definition is um, uh, distribute grants, right? Um, that, you know, it's charged with distributing um, grant funding in, in areas that meet the definition of disproportionately impacted communities. So I think that's why we hear a lot about thinking about does it make sense to distribute funding here, as, as we've heard the task force members say, because certainly one of the main applications of the definition is um, you know, uh, how the advisory board will, will use it to fund projects across the state. So that, that's probably plenty for me and Robin, love to hear from yeah, you. Yeah, I have a question actually. So that's like really interesting. So right now it's air quality penalties, right? That funds the Community Impact Cash Program Fund, which is the basis of the grant program. If I remember correctly, the EJ Advisory Board is in Title 25, but it's not in Article 7, right? So it's not in the AIR Act, it's just in the CVPAG sort of act. So I think it, you know, is it within our span of control to, you know, say, okay, well, we're interested and, in, you know, I'm, again, like setting up a process whereby agencies have to use these criteria, but maybe not all of them at every agency, right, to conduct a public process or rulemaking to identify those communities disproportionately impacted. That'll be um, subject to additional outreach and protections by the agency. And then 
but if if the statute isn't going to identify every single community, how does that work with the EJ advisory board, right? Like, can we propose that that would be like a revision that would say communities identified by CDPHG rulemaking commissions or like whatever as disproportionately impacted? Or, I mean, can we make it by like any agency, right? So we allow for any community that's been, I, anyway, I think you understand where I'm going. Like, cause that, that's a good point. I think um, that I had it considered. We will have to look at all, all the places in statute where that term is used before we can settle on a definition. Well, we, we actually, didn't we actually pull that together when we had that in our first meeting where we knew where it was used in the different statutes? Yeah, how it's used and how it's defined. I think it's how it's defined. Um, and I just uh, would want to make sure like, what, right, so in that chart, we have energy advisory board called out, right, it informs that, but we don't um, necessarily go into detail about how that, how it's integrated. Right. I, by the way, Joel, I look at this thing all the time. Thank you so much to you and staff for putting it together. Super helpful. Um, but anyway, yeah, we, we have this. It's a good resource, so we don't have to go hunting for it. And I think Joel even has the statutes in our folder, so we won't have to go hunting for it. Um, I'm just, it hadn't, it hadn't really clued in. It clicked in my mind that, um, depending on what happens with the definition, we might have to go back and look at potential other statutory changes to make sure they're still consistent um, at the end of the day. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, I, I, I think that each agency should have their own. I think you have your 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 definition, right? Like your, your broad definition that, <clears throat> and then each agency can kind of create a definition that's applicable to their agency and end user. Like for example, for the PUC, we're already working with PUC staff on like our distribution system planning and clean heat filing. We're, we're working with them on how we're, uh, how we're working to implement some of their DI requirements on filings as we speak. And so, um, I think agencies are already starting to move in compliance with 1266. I think give the agencies the, the flexibility to create a definition that uh, works within their user base or audience. And um, as long as it doesn't like completely deviate from, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the broad definition that is established here, um, I, I think you, you allow the, the agencies to kind of run with it because they know they're their audience, their end user base better than we do. And they set the public engagement um, and industry engagement accordingly. Thank you. I'm not a hundred percent sold on that, but I'm looking forward to seeing more in writing. Yeah, I, th I thank you for that, Michael. At the same time, uh, agencies like the PUC uh, are being charged with something that's really enti almost entirely new uh, in, in terms of putting uh, uh, energy equity and in, uh, environmental justice, if you will, into every decision and all the work that they do. So they're, they're really kind of, uh, you know, getting a, 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 you know, kind of wrapping their heads around it. And, and then the question is, you know, when the clean energy plan was being thought up, uh, CDPHE played an interesting role in terms of, of looking at the filing that Excel Energy was making and saying, yes, if, if you do this, it would meet these greenhouse gas reduction requirements. And they basically certified that, and then they were out of the proceeding. They did not continue to participate in the rest of the proceeding. So what I'm interested in right now, more, more granularly is, is there a similar role for eight, one agency to play a role in sort of bringing information that they've, if you will, kind of certified or verified into another agency's uh, um, challenge and, uh, and 
bona fide attempts to to uh, bring that equity into all their decisions. Uh, Susan, I, I I thank you for that, and, and Ian, I certainly hear you. Oh, I think he may have jumped off, or the internet may have gotten disconnected. And that's something that I brought up earlier in the conversation. Have spent time on the executive branch uh, for the city and county in Denver, and this the challenge of implementation and, and operationalizing things that get passed. Um, and so I certainly understand, <clears throat> excuse me, capacity challenge, understanding new definitions, terminologies. And if there's a, I think if there's a, if, if there's a way for agencies to kind of share and contrast, I mean, I'm certainly open to that. And, and I'm certainly mindful of the amount of load and allow an, an amount of uh, rulemakings that are coming uh, down the pipe uh for the PUC staff um and so that that's why we're having the conversation uh because i certainly don't want to put more on the agencies and they can bear um and and we're not even talking about costs right and so um I, i'm mindful of that as well so i hear you and i recognize it and i think that's why we're having this conversation to figure out how we can do it right okay thank you I think Ian put in the, the chat that he had to hop off um, again. So I think we, we've lost him. Um, and I, we had a question in the chat from um, Caitlin Hall about whether there will be public comments on on this. And the answer for anyone who's still here is, is yes, it looks like we've lost Caitlin as well, but we'll, we'll try to track down her, her email address and respond to her by, by email. Are, are there any other members of the public or, or just really anyone on the line with, with any kind of closing thoughts or, or final things they want to share or ask about before we adjourn for the evening? Lumna has taught me to give 10 seconds of silence for people to reflect, so. It's a skill I'm learning, I tend to jump right in, but it, it didn't seem like anyone's jumping in. So um, if one of the task force members wants to make a motion, we, we can adjourn and thanks for the really rich discussion today. I think we have our, our work cut out for us of what we need to get ready for, for you all to succeed in the, the next subcommittee meeting. And I'm excited that we're starting to really formulate some, some ideas for recommendations. This is really great from, from the staff perspective to kind of keep the process moving forward. So thank you all for your, your hard work today. Thank you, Joel, and I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, adjourn. Second. All right. Thank you all. Have a wonderful night. We really Thank appreciate you. Thank you. Have a good night.